I'd like all of us to think about science and its methods and tools. Space time. The nature of human consciousness. Artificial intelligence. Incredibly realistic humanoid robots. The new technology for gene editing. The battle against climate change. Future civilization, Mars, Moon, wherever we're going to go. A laser highway of laser beams shooting the consciousness of aliens at the speed of light. What? Dude. Get smarter faster with new Big Think videos daily from the world's most brilliant minds. Welcome everyone to the Big Think Live webinar. Uh, today's topic is leading remote teams, uh, spanning digital leadership and collaboration. Uh, I'm Peter Hopkins, the president and co-founder of Big Think, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Uh, our guest today is Chris Fussell. Uh, Chris is currently the president of the McChrystal Group, a leadership consulting firm in the D.C. area. He's also a former Navy SEAL officer, serving in the SEALs for 15 years. And he is the co-author with Stanley McChrystal of New York Times bestselling book, Team of Teams, New Rules of Engagement for a Complex World, and its sequel, uh, a Wall Street Journal bestseller, One Mission, How Leaders Build a Team of Teams. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on. So uh, if you, those of you who are watching, if you're new to the Big Think Live, uh, uh, today's webinar will last about 45 minutes. Uh, we'll start with a discussion with Chris first, followed by audience Q&A. So please ask your questions in the comments section of whatever platform you're watching on, be it Facebook, YouTube, uh, Big Think Edge. You can start sending questions right away and we will get to them in the Q&A portion. Um, also, at the very end of, of today's session, we will do an exclusive lesson for our Big Think Edge subscribers. Uh, so if you're a subscriber to Big Think Edge, please stay tuned for that. Uh, and if you are not a Big Think Edge subscriber, check it out at BigThinkEdge.com. All right, let's dive in. Uh, Chris, you have written uh, that there is much we can learn from crises about leadership. Uh, talk to us about what what comes out in these dire, desperate moments when people are being tested uh, that's revealing about the nature of leadership, both, both good and bad? Yeah, well, th this is an interesting one because it's um, the whole world is going through this together, obviously, um, which is not the normal sort of crisis mode. E even big events in our lifetimes, the 9-11s, the uh, financial fallout, nothing compared compared to this um, every organization that we work with and when i went through this uh in, in the military when you have crisis on on scale a, a few things naturally t tend to happen um big big traditional bureaucracy um is in hierarchy those sorts of models um they have this sort of knock-on effect in their design that when they go into crisis because they're designed to handle uh things very well in a predictable environment you know, I can, I can get my intelligence teams together. I can get my sales and marketing together, whatever it is. They have great conversations. It rolls up and we figure out our month, our quarter, our year, et cetera. In times of crisis, a lot of those norms around planning cycles are, are massively disrupted. And so as confusion rolls up the bureaucracy, so to speak, it, power and conversation tend to consolidate up at the very top level. You come to a decision and that cascades back down. The classic example of this in, in geopolitics would be the, the Cuban Missile Crisis because there's so much that's been written on it. And so the world's about to blow up. And so what, what happens here in D.C., where I live, all the, all the great people get together in a very small uh, circle and they spend two weeks or so negotiating with a similarly small team on the Soviet side and they prevent you know the end of the world, essentially, which is fine. You consolidate power and then you, then you push it back down. Uh, but not much else happens when that's going on, right? There's not a lot of other history written about those two weeks during U.S. Uh, U.S. negotiations with the Soviets, uh, and rightfully so. In a in today's world, those moments of of uh, consolidated power are happening more and more regularly. And then in, in in a crisis like we're in right now with the COVID pandemic, you can see this happening across boundaries across industry. Um, and so that consolidation, it feels right, it feels natural. But uh, in my experiences, what we experience in the military and what we've seen in industry, you want to actually look at it the other way. You want to force yourself as a leader, especially when you're in this network spread, very complex environment that we now found ourselves, 
maintain centralized communications, but push authorities down into those at the edge of your organization. But you have to inform them. You have to communicate. We have the, we have the platforms right at our fingertips, literally now. We can connect around the world in real time, have those conversations, pull more people into them, and then you can decentralize down into that, that front line of your organization. It doesn't happen overnight, but when we faced network threats in the special operations community, it took us months, if not years, to learn that behavior. And we have to very quickly, as a, around the globe, get comfortable with this because the smartest people in a time of crisis are the ones that are next to it, whether that's mm -hmm. on the battlefield or in your organization, those are out on the front edge. So ha you have to find a way to inform them and let them make decisions. Can you set the stage of how the concept of team of teams sort of emerged from your experiences uh, on the front lines in, you know, uh, in the SEALs and also General McChrystal's work in developing a counterterrorism strategy writ large? Yeah, sure. Um, essentially, the special operations community um, looks like any other big business, right? You've got this big traditional org charge structure. You've got general officers, your C-suite uh, sitting at the top, nice verticals, geographically dis distributed, responsibilities distributed inside the verticals, et cetera. And this goes back, you know, five, six decades of, of, of history. And at the bottom of that org chart, you find these highly specialized small teams, very adaptable, um, the, the SEAL teams, Army specialized units, et cetera. And they, this system worked quite well, right? I've got my, my planning and strategy here, and then down below it, I have my small team. Small teams were built to detach, go out, do an operation, come back in with new information, and feed that back up into the, into the system for the next cycle of decisions. Not unlike a lot of uh, industry models. Mm -hmm. um, we grew up in a world where the, that was more segmented. So when po problems arose that would require the special operations attention, um, it would be isolated in time and space. We didn't have the ability to do what we can do now and connect around the globe at light speed. And so something that warranted that level of, uh, of response would, it, would be isolated in time and space. So it was mm -hmm. a simple problem. Now, we, post 2001, we enter an information age battlefield and we found as soon as we got to that problem, it had already, or wasn't by us interacting with it, we were forcing it to connect, connect with that global network so one team on its own wasn't sufficient. So we tried to flood in multiple teams. Multiple teams working in those traditional silos were insufficient, all because mm -hmm. much less capable adversary was connected at light speed, operating as a network while we were operating as a very effective but traditional top-down uh, model. And so the team of teams methodology evolved out of that sense of necessity. Networks will tire out big bureaucracy so how do we how do we network ourselves in a similar fashion without losing the structure and the, the strength you get through that that scalable hierarchy so we eventually became what we refer to as this, this team of teams model really a, a hybrid between those two things like uh, supply chain and logistics can, could remain very structured uh, because they had to be precise and timely and they needed gantt charts and planning etc and let's layer in a communication structure uh, globally so that where those teams that are in the field learning in, in real time give them a space where they can connect globally and we can pull that agile nature that exists inside small teams up into this global enterprise that was you know north of 20,000 people spread all around the globe uh, mm -hmm. didn't happen overnight but that's where that that teaming at scale concept and methodology started to come from Talk to us about what that process is like when you're in the middle of a crisis that your planning and resources and the current organizational structure are not suited to, and you're seeing failure after failure as a result of that. How do you, as an organization, as a leader, in real time, begin to calibrate what's going wrong and how to fix it and 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 what what is that mechanism like and, and how do you have to carve out some mental uh space to allow that uh you know sort of learning to happen you know as, as the crisis is unfolding yeah it's it, you know it's really interesting and and as i was saying 
before, one of the core beliefs that we experience and we have for, for industry in normal times, and especially now, is think about how small teams work. Right? We've all been part of great small teams in our professional careers, most likely. Um, the, the world I came from was grounded on, on specialized small teams. They do what you just described all the time. You know, from sports to sales to special operations, wherever it is, you, you get 20 highly competent people that trust each other and understand the mission. You put them into an unknown environment that's changing constantly, and they very organically uh, learn, adjust, react, learn, adjust, react, etc. And if they can do that faster than the, the adversary, they, they win, right? That's hard to scale, right? So one of the, but, but the, the, the core idea of can you do both in real time? Of course, we've all, we've all done that, right? We've all adapted in the moment when we're with that small, small unit, small trusted team. At scale, we realized um, what's, what are the fundamental drivers that allow an organization to do that? And we boiled down, and this goes back to the, so the origins of this thinking under, under Stan McChrystal back in that environment. Uh, we know small teams, when they go out onto the battlefield or into whatever high stress environment, they have this sense of shared consciousness. They, they have a shared understanding of the data around them that's changing in real time, whether that's, I mean, it's, it's the blind pass in basketball, right? Everybody's moving down the court. The, 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 the guard at the front knows we're all reading the same defense. I just know intuitively my teammate X is going to be to my back left and they can they, they hit it every time, right? That's shared understanding. But that's small numbers seeing the environment through one lens. Can we scale that up was the question. The, the answer was not sure, but we believe it'll start through more effective, transparent and inclusive communications. Uh, we can't all be looking at the same thing, but we know we now have the, the ability to connect digitally around the world. That's no longer a barrier. We don't need to be in the same room. So could we pull tens, hundreds, thousands of people into one common conversation on a cadence that matched the rate of change in the external environment? And again, this didn't happen with the flick of a switch. But in time, the answer to that was yes. Stan McChrystal and this, this then spread around the globe started this process of every 24 hours, seven days a week for years on end, having a 60 to 90 minute discussion with people in the organization. And it wasn't a top down military based directive sort of meeting. It was a bottom up, who, who are you, those teams that are closest to the edge? I wanna hear from you, what are you seeing? What's changed, et cetera. Let's have a discussion about it. What are we learning? And now how do we adjust our thinking and pivot our strategy slightly perhaps um, to your point, so that we can do both at the same time. We can operate, we can learn, we can adjust. And eventually those, those forums, those communication structures that were put in place had six, seven, 8,000 people a day you know, on one single net, just listening to each other, having a conversation through video, through chat rooms, through follow-up correspondence, et cetera. And we became this, this global real-time learning organization. And this was all done virtually um, and so in a way, you might even say that the current moment where we're you know, really segueing to a virtual workplace actually may, might unlock opportunities uh, to manage large organizations better at scale. Yeah, no, it's, it's a super interesting point. Um, there's a strange irony and twist here, uh, but, this, the, but the parallels are striking, right? So we've been talking about this internally for, for, since this whole thing began. What we faced was we had a traditional structure centrally located, you know, a few headquarters inside the U.S., but very top down, one building sort of mentality. And then we would detach teams to go to a problem, not unlike the way a lot of big industry operates. But we're going to fly to Chicago for the sales meeting and come back to, to, to the New York headquarters to report. Um, we found that there was suddenly a distributed networked threat. So we had to we had to try to be everywhere at once. Right. So those teams had to detach from the physical known location, the headquarters, and distribute themselves around the world. So we we were forced to become a remote work uh, model, right? Um, whether we liked it or, or not, we didn't think of it like that, but it was the same thing that this COVID pandemic has now done to us. We have to become a remote and digitally connected uh, uh, company or wherever, whatever space you might be in. And the knock-on effects of that, were we, we learned all these these tools uh, and eventually develop this operating framework, the team of teams concept. And it's our belief that, you know, every crisis presents new opportunity, 
on the backside of this, I think we will be a much more capable uh, workforce broadly because people will understand over two months, four months, six months, however long this goes on, if there's new waves, we will be able to flow in and out of very traditional top-down you know, physical environment workplace and into decentralized remote work environments. And, you know, we all sort of get a collective pass on this one because no one really saw it coming to this this level or when we did, it was too late. But the in the fall and spring and the next next crisis like this, uh, this this needs to be the wake up call and, and, and people won't necessarily get the pass next time. So we have to learn fast and adjust. Mm. In this new virtual world, uh, are there qualities of leadership uh, that are distinguished maybe from the physical world? Are there new traits that leaders need to bring to the table in light of the you know remote dispersed nature of the organizations they're trying to lead? Yeah, no, I think there, there certainly are. Um, one of the things that's easy to forget is that uh, although it's obvious when you say it out loud, we no longer have the, the hallway, right? We no longer have the chatter before and after the meeting. Um, we no longer have the, 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 the coffee pot in the kitchen. Um, so, and it's, it, and it's easy as you get more senior in an organization to underestimate or undervalue how much of work actually happens in those interactions, right? So if you and I run the company, we sit through the meeting and we, we look at the PowerPoint deck and we, we make some declarative statements. And then in most organizations that, that I've been part of or worked with, the meeting ends and people walk out of the hallway into their little sub networks and say, what exactly were they trying to get at there? Let me clarify this nuance. You know him better. What did he mean by this? And when we end a Zoom meeting, that doesn't happen. Or if it does happen, and we see this all the time now, the last six weeks, people get bombarded and they have these cascading meeting after meeting after meeting. Mm -hmm. A lot of people I've spoken with is, why am I busier now <laughs> from home than I was when we were in the office? And it's because of that, you lose that, that physical nuance, right? That's where you get all those, that, that cultural intuition sort of bubbles up there. Um, so yeah, leaders need to, to recognize that uh, and, and present themselves differently in these sorts of forums. One of the pieces of advice we, we, we've been giving regularly is, don't just take your Outlook calendar put it into Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever your platform is and think we're good, right? Mm. Because that, you're not good. It, you have to adjust your behavior. You have to communicate more regularly. You have to pull in more people. So you have to create some sort of larger vir virtual but video forums. And you can do that with dozens of people, hundreds of people, it depends on your organization. And when you go into that environment, lots of leaders would say, well, I kind of do that every quarter anyway. Yeah, but don't don't think of this as a video town hall that you did every quarter. This is maybe three times a week mm. and bring your best leader into that environment. Bring the leader that you are when you're when it's six of your trusted folks around a table. Bring that person into that virtual environment with 200 or 400 or a thousand of your people twice a week. And you will be able to cut through those barriers. You can recreate that hallway cultural environment in a virtual space. And I say that because that's what we live. That's the only tool we had. And we lived in that environment 24 seven for years on end. And you forgot whether you were physically together or not. And I had some really good friends from those experiences that it, we would go three years without ever being in the same room. And you lost that sense of when was the last time we were actually physically in the same space? It just didn't matter anymore. Hmm. How are you able to build uh, rapport in you know, in the absence of, of, of being physically present. I mean, uh, and, and, and what does culture look like if it's not being sort of set, it's not the tone and the atmosphere that's being set in the physical office. How, how did you think about th those challenges? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it has to start with leaders and you, you absolutely don't want to do that. One of the things that this sort of communication does to us is, and this is just a knock on of how we've leveraged it, traditionally the last 15 or 20 years is it puts us in a little more there's a camera so it's a little more static i'm not looking at someone i'm looking at a little uh dot on my ipad um there's uh, a slide deck next to me so i feel like you know i am i centered am i talking about am i reading the bullet points i use it in a less a much more formal manner and so that behavior can easily roll in now and become the new norm and 
uh, that's where leaders have to recognize, okay, how do I pull that hallway culture in here? So the advice we, we give there is um, look for moments to be honest and, and transparent. Look for moments to be human. Look for moments to pull others into the discussion. And so it's, it really is, it's incumbent and starts with the senior most folks to try to inject moments of honesty, uh, humility, empathy, uh, just basic humanity into these virtual spaces and the, the payoff will come, right? And, and that can be as simple as recognizing um, who, who you're speaking with. Um, rather than just saying, okay, let's go to marketing for an update, go to uh, Sarah in marketing, thank her for the report she sent yesterday. Say, everybody, if you haven't seen it, uh, Sarah, could you hang in the chat room? Because I thought it was really good, especially the second paragraph on X. Um, thanks for all your, you and your team are doing there in Chicago. Hey, how, how are the kids, by the way? You got two at home, is it driving you crazy? You know, those little moments, to, even if it's 300 people on the line, others will realize, wow, that's, that's still a, a human to human conversation. Um, use and we do this inside our group all the time using chat rooms on the side during during larger video forums so that there could <clears throat> there could be side di dialogues going on people having fun with each other posting memes whatever it takes to to introduce a little bit of humor and humanity and fun into the way you communicate because that's not the norm for most organizations and how they've leveraged video conferencing they tend to wait until the hallway to do that but with that that gone where are you going to find that new opportunity? And it has to start with leadership. What's your advice for those who are being led? You know, it's been said that if you want to advance in an organization, you need to make use of the, you know, the elevator moments, the hallway moments. In the absence of those, how do you establish yourself? How do you contribute? And how do you, uh, you know, find those opportunities for collision and, and sort of intersection? Yeah. To Two thoughts on that. One, um, and we, we try to encourage our own team uh, that ranges from, you know, boomers to, to millennials um, to and the, the larger organizations that we work with. One, keep in mind, this this is also a phone, right? You can actually pick this up and just just talk to people. Right. So don't don't wait for single ankle anchor points inside the uh, the communication structures being put in place by your leadership. Um, you don't have the hallway connection anymore. So don't be afraid to just pick up the phone and call people <clears throat> just to check in two, three minutes. How, how are things going? You look tired this morning. Anything I can help with or just great to see your face this morning on the on the catch up, et cetera. Uh, just hearing other people's voices, um, building in, uh, you know, mid or lower level leaders, team leaders, et cetera, in organizations, finding ways to be relevant to those that look up to them as their as their manager in the larger organization. Uh, video happy hours on a, on a Friday, a quick catch up over the weekend. The, the, the technology is right at our fingertips. Be creative um, in how you leverage it. And then for those individual contributors, um, again, this is much easier when the tone is set by leaders at the top that they're looking for that bottom up conversation. But not being afraid to say, hey, I see what we're talking about in these, you know, these three times a week when we're updating. I understand the, uh, the changes in the Chicago market. Uh, market or of, of key importance. If I can take three or four minutes tomorrow, I'd, I'd happily give a rundown of some client discussions we've had over this week. Uh, moments like that to, to sort of enter into those conversations um, can be really powerful. And then the, in reverse, leaders especially setting that tone and not just talking to the, the head of that office, but going down, hey, who, who, was, the, who was the analyst on that? Oh, that was... Uh, Mike and Terry did that. Hey, can they pop on? I'd, I'd just love to hear their perspective. Even if it's out of the blue, put them on the spot, pull them into the conversation, thank them for their work. You'll, you will learn something and they will learn, wow, I can actually inject myself into this and still be a known actor in this, uh, in, in this company. The, the reality was for us in, in the military, we, this was the most powerful tool towards creating a meritocratic system that we'd ever found, right? Because we learned at every level, it was a, it was much easier rather than just talking to, you know, Chris, the senior officer in some outpost, um, for the senior leadership to say, yeah, Chris, great to see you. Who was the intel person on that? Oh, that was so and so over here. They hop on the camera. It's some younger civilian analyst, perhaps attached to you that normally would never be heard from in the in the sort of traditional bureaucratic layering. Now on camera, talking to six thousand people about what she is the 
the subject matter expert in in the world and suddenly you have thousands of people that say oh that's where all that brilliant stuff comes from boy i'm going to remember her name if i ever put together a team that needs that skill i'm going to call her uh, now we're going to move on to audience questions uh the first one that uh has come up chris is uh what is the most effective visualization practice or technique you could recommend? Uh, I know that that has, you know, comes into play in SEALs and in general leadership. Uh, does visualization factor into your thinking at all? Um, for, for, yeah, could answer that a few ways. Visualization of um, tactical operations has, has been uh, something that's been Dug off quite deeply over the last few years inside that that community, and there's some overlay here with professional sports, etc. Um, connection between, you know, subconscious cognitive uh, uh, thinking and your your actions. Um, one of the one of the uh, the core tenets of training so hard in the special operations community is you are trying to buy down as much, uh, or you're probably trying to put as much into muscle memory space as possible, because you know the science has proven for years that when you get into moments of, of panic crisis, uh, you know, fight or flight mode, um, people in those communities will go into to fight mode. Um, you want as much uh, of their physical action to be uh, in that uh, immediately reactive, low cognitive load space, right? So you train really, really hard, and when a uh, a, there's a problem in a, let's say you're skydiving at night and you have some sort of malfunction. You don't want that operator to have to think through, I'm going to do this, 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 this. That's why you train to it so, so many times with such deep repetition so that they're really not thinking in the moment. They're just solving the problem. And as you do that through muscle memory, it opens up space to, uh, to think through at a higher level. What am I going to do once this is cleared, once I'm safe again? How am I going to reconnect with my teammates, et cetera, et cetera. And so over the last uh, probably 10 to 15 years, pivoting that into the use of VR technology, visualization to even in when you can't go out and train in the field, how else can we get that cognitive load down and put into muscle memory uh, as many of those things that, are, that we can so that we buy a white space uh, for the operator in, in, in moments of crisis. So I think it's, it's usually important in that, in that environment. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, this is from somebody who says they're managing a remote team right now and their concern is smothering their uh, colleagues that the sort of how did how not to succumb to the insecurity that by virtue of not seeing and being there all the time, you need to check in, you need to assert yourself, you need to be on email all the time. How, how do you think about that that trade off between wanting to know what's going on and being sort of micromanaging from afar. Yeah. In, in, so in the military, um, we called that the, the thousand mile screwdriver, right? Cause you could, wherever you were, there could be somebody with, you know, back at headquarters with a screwdriver that would always kind of twist at you. Um, so you don't want to do, you don't want to do that, right? It's, it's, it's caustic and it can, and it can slow things down as you're trying to speed things up. Um, so, so a few things to think about one, um, Think about how you're communicating, uh, and by that I mean very, very, uh, very practically. What are the communication forums we're using? Um, do we have three times a week a Zoom meeting we're all hopping on? And by all, how many? Who is in there? Pull as many people as you can in that in that environment, and then what are we covering? So you want to, you want to be able to create a, an environment where you're giving your team opportunity to talk and connect, whether it's through video or in the side chat rooms, etc. And so that so that everybody get that sense of shared consciousness of what's happening out in in uh in the field and that as it as that refines itself you'll find as a leader you know more and more you know enough uh during those windows and if you're not getting enough continue to tweak the agenda the approach the periodicity who's in there etc so that during the the gaps between that you find much uh a smaller need to follow up with individual teammates and say where are we on on the, the Smith deal, on Project X, whatever the case may be. Um, it'll never be perfect, right? Because we're in a, we're a pretty complex uh, change environment right now, but you'll be much closer. And I always encourage leaders, every time you feel yourself going down this road, um, which is very natural, take, take note of it and say, 
literally, I should recommend jotting those things down and start to review those. What are the types of things I'm asking my team about too regularly where I feel like I might be smothering them? And should, should we pull those into a more common conversation? And would that buy, buy down my need for individual follow-up? And as a knock-on, would they start learning from each other and we'd, we'd collectively get better about these sorts of things? Um, and the, the other benefit of that is teams start to see what you, uh, how you lead, how you think. Right. So if I have a one off conversation with my boss and she asks me about the Smith project, um, that's one thing. If if collectively we know all of us know she's really interested in these types of deals, then we're starting to get inside of her head more. Right. So pulling those into a more public and transparent space can be helpful on that end. Uh, another audience question asks sort of what are the steps of of evolving into a team of teams, if you know, going from hierarchical top-down structure to a more decentralized structure are there sort of key milestones or things that a leader uh or an organization should have in mind as they sort of segue into this new approach sure the the, the first one is it's uh <clears throat> it's not it's not an overnight change um step one is uh really deeply analyzing your your environment and i don't mean that by uh, senior leader and chief strategy officer getting together and, and figuring everything out and then rolling out a plan. Um, the, in fact, in the world I grew up in, the, the exact opposite happened. Um, what it, how this started to evolve was our senior leadership being uh, very transparent and honest. And before we had the, or they had the wherewithal to start creating these massive communication structures, et cetera, they started spending time in, in, in conversation with those that were at the front edge of our organization, literally on the front line in many cases. Um, and the first time I remember having this discussion, I was part of a, you know, a four person element sitting on some remote outpost in the middle of nowhere, sort of on the edge of the fight. And uh, our senior general officer and, and one or two others showed up and we had a discussion at a flip chart about what we were seeing. And they were saying very honestly, this was early in our transition. Here's how we're structured. Um, this is, I've been in this business for 25, 30 years now. We're good at doing X, right? Detaching from the ship and going out and doing stuff and coming back. We think we're fighting something that looks different. It's some sort of network sort of thing. We're not exactly sure why. We're wrestling with how this system as it's built gets ahead of this system over here. We know where we have more capability, more resourcing, et cetera, but it's still outmaneuvering us. And we had an hour and a half long, just open-ended discussion. And in hindsight, I realized they were doing that all over the world. And they were, they were getting understanding from those on the ground and developing a more core thesis. And so as they started to roll out the change, we all saw ourselves in that. Um, now with, with digital communication, it's the nature of, of business now, leaders can do that very quickly. Go around, start talking with your people. What's working? What isn't? What are you feeling and seeing? Uh, send pulse surveys. There's lots of stuff you can do in that space. And then talk about it. Come back and say, okay, we've had a bunch of discussions. Here's what we're learning. One of the Real realities is we need to communicate with more transparency and more inclusion about certain things so that you on the edge that we were just talking to about this have the insights and the empowerment to move faster. So we're going to start tweaking a little bit of our communications and decision making structure towards a network sort of model. And then you start to layer and change. You start to look for quick wins and you can advertise those internally. And, and it's pretty soon before you know it, it gets a life of its own and people realize this is the more honest and, and transparent I am in these communication forums, the faster I can move at the edge, the better we are as an organization. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that it's almost uh, that, that the culture is becoming visualized because the communication is so uh, you know, ubiquitous and, and instantaneous and ongoing. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right, Peter. And, and one of the upsides to this is um, it's, in our, it's in our DNA, like we like our species likes being in trust-based small tribal units, right? It's kind of the, it's the macro history of going back thousands of, of years. And we now have the technology to create that feeling of, of tribal cohesion and trust and relationship-based organization at a massive scale if we leverage technology effectively. And one of, again, what, what good can come from a crisis? You brought it up earlier. It's we are in this situation, whether we like it or not, leaders now have 
the imperative and the advantage of they can they can leverage this to create that at scale and we come out the backside of this don't lose it retain that mm. we've, we've figured out how to create a an interconnected trust-based system through digital platforms at a massive scale so let's hold on to that coming out of this mm. Here's another uh, question from the audience, uh, sort of keying off uh, America's fascination with seals and the sort of, uh, you know, almost superhuman uh, attri uh, attributes ascribed to them. The, the questioner wants to know what, uh, specifically from your seal experiences, have informed your approach to business? And also, um, are there any psychological or resilience uh, exercises that you're using as a individual now during this uh, that you've drawn from from your SEAL experience? <clears throat> yeah, the uh, the fascination might be a little overblown, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm 5'8 and 150 on a, on a good day, so uh, the Hollywood version isn't always exactly right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, our, our community as well as other um, special operations communities, we have the advantage of a long history, right? We've been we've been at this for, for generations figuring out how to select people into these communities. And if you're, if you're selecting really for one thing, there's a baseline of, of physical attribute that has to be there, but it's not, uh, it's not professional sports caliber, right? More, more than anything, you're looking for a, uh, a, a, a grittiness and a refusal to quit, right? Because you want uh, a plus a teaming oriented personality. And so you very, especially in the SEAL teams, you very deliberately put uh, people into situations where even if you are that superhuman division one athlete superstar, you just can't solve it by yourself. You you need teammates to come and you're in that environment for months and months on end. And if you're caustic, if you're not a team player, eventually the, the you know, the most superhuman on the planet will fall out. Right. And so you end up with these sort of gritty focused, team oriented uh, folks that come through through the other side. At the, at, the, at the core of it, that's the trick to special operations. It is more than the sum of its parts. Um, and that's, that's been core to the thesis going back as long as those uh, units have existed. Um, and, and yeah, to the, to the second part of that question, um, certainly I think there's, there's been some interesting writings lately on how uh, this moment is affecting veteran communities versus others. Um, and, and in some ways, you know, d military deployments uh, are all about having your your basic day-to-day uh, -day freedoms taken away from you, um, and you you surrender to that, right? So you're used to going from uh, your warm, comfortable bed with your family. Forty-eight hours later, you're in the middle of some combat zone. You can't leave a certain perimeter, and it's very dangerous. And that, that, that. All, all your life is disrupted massively in an instant. And on the other side, your families are dealing with that same disruption. So um, you, you, there's a there's a quicker pivot, and I think maybe to the question one of the key factors is acceptance of this is a current reality there is no point in allowing it to frustrate you behind beside the recognition that yeah i wish things were different but let's compartmentalize that because we're not going to change it let's do what we can to support our uh friends our family our local community our our, our organization and let's play our part as those that are in a position to drive a solution on the back side of this uh, uh, do their work, right? So I think, you know, that there was in the, in the military environment, there were certainly frustrating moments and uh, operations, et cetera, overseas where you could say this, this whole thing is a total mess, or you could say, I'm going to play the part I can right now with me and my team. We're going to accomplish our part of mission and we will feed up uh, what, what we can to, to, to impact the broader strategy, right? So I, I do think it's an important part of that. It's an interesting point, not losing sight of, not letting a general sense of the trajectory uh, of things get in the way of the immediate tasks at hand. I think that that's a really great piece of advice that I think everyone could apply in various uh, aspects of their life at this moment. Um, another audience question which I think is uh, really relevant uh, and important for you to comment on uh, is, have you, are you, have you identified or seen instances, whether they're clients of the McChrystal Group, whether they're government organizations or others whose uh, response to ch uh, the crisis and how they've evolved as an organization in crisis reflects um, the best practices that you're trying to impart. Are, are there any case studies yet that you've identified that seem to be 
doing this right? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've been at this for about a decade now. And so, um, yeah, we've, we've got reams of uh, case studies, obviously, up on our, on our consulting, our practice website uh, for those that are interested. Uh, but most encouraging and interesting to me over the last two months has been um, teams that we worked with, leadership teams that we worked with, organizations that we worked with over the last five or six years who have, um, uh, we, st we tend not to stay inside an organization for, you know, 10 years straight, right? Who have, will have reached out to us recently after having wrapped up our, our focused work maybe two years ago and saying, hey, the, the, the work you did uh, got us through the first two months of this. I don't know how we would have survived if we didn't have this sort of distributed network-based mentality, communication structures in place that we could quickly pivot toward and, and amplify, speed up, et cetera. Um, and we've seen some uh, organizations in, in uh, places like consumer goods, et cetera, that we've worked with in historically move very smoothly, as smoothly as can be possible through, through this crisis and uh, had some great discussions with them about, about how this methodology has been helpful. Um, and then even inside of our own group, obviously we're, we're smaller hundred folks, but we're spread around the world and it's a pretty complex little, little business. And we have had, uh, it just lived into our own DNA and took what was normally a, a five to seven day cadence. We were very disciplined about how we communicate, how we share information and recognizing the environment around us is going to get out of control very quickly. So going back over a month, we pivoted to a, a seven day cadence, a quick sync with our whole team, seven days a week. We've now backed that to, off to six days a week, just reading the market and the, and the environment around us. Um, but that daily cadence, it may, we'll see how long it lasts, but it allowed us to very quickly normalize and keep everyone informed and deal with the internal change and how we're gonna go into the market. So I, it's a, it's a model that can um, speed up, speed down, get larger, get smaller, depending on the environment. That's the idea of uh, that sort of teaming mentality at scale. Information is so much at the core and the dissemination of information and transparency is so much at the core of this concept. Um, could you speak a little bit about the tension between putting a rosy spin or perhaps looking at a situation from its most favorable vantage point, let's put it, and just, you know, the cold, hard truth, unspun, unvarnished. Uh, is there a role for being a cheerleader in all of this? Um, and how do you uh, balance that against the sort of need to, to get, you know, raw data out there and, and to have it, you know, unbiased as much as possible? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a, it, it's a really important point. Um, there's a, there's a saying in the, in the service, you know, if, if things are going bad, it's the it's the people on the front line that are getting shot at, right? So, <laughs> cheerleading won't always work, right? They're they're, they're close to the problem, so um, be thoughtful in how you're trying to describe that or, or capture it, because they'll see through the the fluff very quickly. Um, that said, of course, there's a, there's a role for um, the way you capture that and describe it, right? Um, near term reality long-term optimism about who you are as a team um, and how you're going to get through this, I think is, is an important role for, for leaders to, to play. Um, and so but, but one of the keys there is setting a cadence on how you communicate. And by that, I mean, just what's, what's that rhythm? Is it daily? Is it weekly, et cetera? That is, um, I've always thought it critical. That is just a step faster than what you think is the key rate of change in, in, in the environment around you whether that's daily, weekly, et cetera, depends on the world you're in. I would say it's much more aggressive than it probably was six weeks ago, right? And if you set it to that pace, then leaders can't come in there as the most informed person in, in the organization. In a traditional bureaucracy, you can do that. You can get together and do your quarterly town hall and everybody thinks you're brilliant and they don't know that you've just spent five days, you know, just destroying your staff to give you all that information so you, so you know everything, right? Set it on a cadence where you have to walk in there as just a raw and honest leader and say, okay, Peter, what's going on in, in, in the New York market? Um, I'm tracking this, but it seems like two or three other things are going on. Talk to us. And then now you have the stage and you, you're, the next five things you say, I might have no idea what's coming out of your mouth. Everybody else on the net can see that. And they're seeing, wow, Chris is being an honest, vulnerable leader. He's, put, he, he's putting Steve, Peter in, in the driver's seat right now. He's acknowledging what he doesn't know. Some of it he might not like to hear, 
and they're going to they're going to dialogue on it. And then then I'm going to reach out to others, maybe junior people on your team, people from the old Milwaukee office. We'll have an honest conversation. Right. If I slow it down to the point where you've given me all that in PowerPoint deck and email and I walk in and say, here's what's happening in New York and Milwaukee, I might feel good like I look like the all knowing leader, but we're going way too slow. Right. You just can't keep that that pace. So finding that balance and leaders forcing themselves to be uncomfortable is a critical part of it. Now, uh, we're coming up on the last audience question uh, as we're running short on time. Um, this one asks you to put back your sort of uh, seal hat on, but I think you can also speak to it from the vantage point of, of being a sort of an organizational expert. Um, this person asks, in the military, I'm sure you had to develop mechanisms for living where you work and working where you live when deployed. Uh, do you have advice for people on how to cope with working from home when work is intense and adrenaline keeps you up all night? Uh, how do we manage having all of our lives play out in such, you know, relatively now smaller and confined spaces, um, you know, within the context uh, of, of, of trying to be a team member now in all of these sort of virtual ways? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it's... It, it's 90% similar, um, to be to be honest. I mean, take out the uh, sort of the, I guess the threat of the environment. Um, but the big 10% difference, maybe it's I'm undervaluing it probably is I, I never had my uh, kids on deployment. <laughs> so that's that's an unpredictable variable that we're all figuring out, those of us that have kids that are homeschooling right now. Um, but aside from that, I think the um, we've advised a lot of leaders, like think about what your, uh, I like to think of it as your own personal cocktail. What is the mix of things that you put together to keep you uh, sane and on the rails. You know, most, in my experience, the majority of high performance leaders and organizations in whatever industry, uh, they've got some interesting wiring, right? They're a little bit manic, a little bit stressed, very alpha in their, in their approach. Um, and there are certain things that keep that on, on the rails, right? It's a mix of, uh, for, for me, it's, it's a mix of, of exercise, um, the right amount of sleep. I, I know plus or minus 30 minutes what keeps me at my, my best uh, diet, time with my family, alone time, somewhere in that sort of five part mix, I know what the right blend is, right? And so my, like everyone else here, my gym closed down uh, six weeks ago, right? So had to immediately pivot and say, Aha, I know I need that physical outlet. What's that gonna look like in a much more uh, constrained space? And there's lots of ways to, to get there. It's not gonna be the, 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 the perfect treadmill, my favorite one of the gym, but I'll figure that out, right? I'll get my heart rate up and I'll expend some energy. Um, Family time, personal time, etc. I, I would recommend to people figure out what that looked like when you're at your peak performance in normal times, and then how do I map it over into this more constrained space? The first thing that any SEAL unit would do, and this is probably playing into the Hollywood narrative, but any outpost you got sent to, hey, go find this you know plot of dirt in the middle of nowhere and, and create an outpost. First thing that showed up was the gym equipment, right? And maybe that was just a TRX and a kettlebell, right? But got, guys knew, hey, if we go out there, we're going we're gonna to kill each other if we don't have a way to expend some energy, fit, right? So that's, we're going to get our comms set up, we're going to get a little gym set up, and then we'll bring in some food and the other stuff. And five days later, we'll work about, worry about where we're sleeping, right? Because um, they knew, like, that's the cocktail to make this unit effective. So I would, I would advise people to start thinking about what was it then and how do I map it over to today? Right. No, it's good advice. I think it's so easy to forget the essentials uh, when they're taken out of context. Um, well, Chris, uh, thank you so much for making time for us, sharing your incredibly valuable perspective. Uh, this wraps up our public portion of the webinar uh, for our Facebook and YouTube viewers. If you enjoyed the webinar, please join us next Tuesday at noon for a conversation with leadership consultant and uh, recruiting guru, James Citron. He's been responsible for uh, placing some of the top executives in the world uh, at the helms of major corporations. And uh, during this time where uh, so much is uncertain about the labor market, uh, Jim's perspective on how to uh, succeed and thrive in this uncertain time uh, will be uh, really interesting. So I encourage you to uh, join us for that on Tuesday. And for our Big Think Edge subscribers, uh, in just a couple moments, we'll dive into an exclusive lesson with Chris. And to everyone else, thank you again for tuning in.
Okay, Chris, we are back uh, for our subscriber exclusive. Um, and for this, we want to talk about vir uh, virtual meeting technology, uh, specifically sound. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed, actually, because uh, in the prep for this session, uh, we're, we're trying out a fancy new system that lets us uh, put all sorts of interstitials in. And of course, uh, on Chris's end, there wasn't a, 